this is this is what gives you the right to ask to attend this meeting. <laughs> don't get to attend the meeting. You get to ask for permission. That's all the wrestling card does for you. So I just couldn't let this centennial go by without trying to do something. And hopefully I've dug up a little bit that you won't know, or at least won't be too familiar with. Uh, and uh, the, the photo that you see right there, of course, that's the traditional one. You've seen that everywhere. And uh, that's the after it happened. But we're going to back up a little bit. First, I just want to acknowledge the archives. Uh, virtually all of the photos that I'm going to show you will be from the newspapers, the Butte Minor and the Anaconda Standard, from June of 1914 here in the archives. There is so much that you can't do without these archives, and, and it's wonderful. And thank you all, and thank you, Aubrey, and thank you, volunteers, the whole works. It's a, it's a wonderful place here. So, the overview. I think you most, most of you probably know this. June 13th, Miners Union Day, the parade held on that day, uh, devolved into a riot. The riot proceeded north up Main Street and attacked the Miners Union Hall that was just right over here on North Main Street. The memorial's there, you're probably all familiar with the memorial. They ransacked the place, they took the safe out and blew it up. In the ensuing 10 days, various things happened, but the most important thing probably is that in these few days here, the miners rejected the Western Federation of Miners. That was the umbrella organization that the Butte Miners Union was part of, and they created a new union. And then finally, on June 23rd, the Western Federation of Miners called their meeting in the Union Hall, and it was that evening that the Union Hall was destroyed. So that's the overview. So let's talk about some of the detail. The, the origins go all the way back to 1878. That's when the Butte Miners Union was established as the Butte Workingmen's Union, renamed the Butte Miners Union in 1885. And then the Western Federation of Miners, which is multiple unions, multiple miners unions in multiple states, uh, Wyoming, uh, Idaho, Montana, the Black Hills of South Dakota, and in Colorado. All of that was the Western Federation of Miners, but it was formed here in Butte in 1893. Uh, fast forward about 10 years, and the WFM and others came together to create the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, known today as the most radical of all of the labor unions that were present at the time. Well, Charles Moyer here is an important player in everything that we're going to talk about today. Probably the single most important individual, I would say, in, uh, in the 10 days that we're going to be talking about. Many individuals, of course, were involved, and many had significant roles. But Charles Moyer, the president of the Western Federation of Miners for, as you see, 24 years, was probably the dominant ind individual force behind everything that happened, plus and minus. And in 1908, Moyer decided that the IWW was too radical. That's not really a big surprise. They were really pretty radical, no question about it. The IWW came to advocate for the complete overthrow of the capitalist system. When I'm talking to tourists, I say, if this is socialism and this is capitalism, the IWW was right here. They were just one step away from being flat out communist. So uh, they were radical, no question. And they advocated violence as well. So there were a lot of issues to be to have differences with. So Moyer and, of course, others, he couldn't do it purely by himself, but he was the president, took the Western Federation of Miners out of the uh, IWW and affiliated it with the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, which still exists today, combined with the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO. So they were the sort of conventional, standard, uh, labor unions that we know and, and love or hate today, pretty much. The tensions intensified over these few years here, 1913 and 14, mostly because of strikes and, and, and issues in Colorado and here in Butte, as well as elsewhere. And then the talks of the thing we're going to talk about today is the uh, events of June of 1914, and in the future, the WFM changed its name there, and. Butte Miners Union, local number one within the WFM, did continue to exist. So that's the, the framework of how the unions evolved uh, in this time frame uh, to uh, uh, set the scene here. The specific roots of this go back all the way to Moyer's upset, shall we say, his distrust, his animosity with the IWW that, as you saw, goes all the way back to 1908. 
So the tensions existed between the WFN and the IWW for at least the previous uh, six years, if not longer, maybe all the way back to the start of it. But the immediate causes were the, that attitude about it being too radical, and the radicals, whoever they were, and I want you to not think of the radicals as equal IWW. It was much more complicated than that. But uh, they did see the mismanagement in the WFM. Specifically, there was a strike going on in Michigan, which had essentially failed some months ago, and yet the labor unions here, the WFM and the Butte Miners Union, were lever leveling fees against the Butte Miners to pay into the strike fund for those guys back in Michigan. Well, the question was, was it worth it? And number two, was that money even getting to the strikers in Michigan, or were it, was it being funneled around by the, by the local officers of the WFM and the Butte Miners Union? No, none of that was ever proven, but that was very much the suspicion in, in June of 1914. The rustling card system, you have your rustling cards. This was a way for the company to, the companies, to filter the uh, applicants for jobs. They had to, to get the rustling card, you had to answer a questionnaire, two or three pages. Uh, what's your religion? What, have you ever been affiliated with the IWW? Do you have any relatives affiliated with the IWW? It was a pretty obnoxious way of deciding whether or not to give the person the, the permit to apply for a job. It didn't guarantee a job at all. It gave you the permission to apply. So the miners hated the rustling card system that had been instigated in 1912, so it's only two years old. The, uh, the, the things that labor unions are supposed to do, fighting for wages and safety and health and things like that, they paid lip service to that, but they in fact in Butte did not do any of that, at least not in the uh, most recent years leading up to June of 1914. And then one of the most precipitous causes was dishonest elections. In April of 1914, at a meeting of the union, the Butte Miners Union, affiliated with the, with the Western Federation of Miners, the progressives, as they were called at that point in time, as opposed to rebels and secessionists, the progressives were advocating for the next election to be held using the voting machines that the city of Butte owned. And not only was it rejected out of hand, it was rejected by the president of the Butte Miners Union in a very disparaging way. He, he called for a vote to throw the motion in the wastebasket. This was, this was offensive. It, it, and, and there is some thought that if the president of the Butte Miners Union in that meeting in April had been at a minimum polite, the vote would have gone in his favor anyway for the motion to use the voting machines. But then the radical side could not have said, you just discarded it. You have been so obnoxious to us that we do not trust you anymore. Well, everybody, both sides acknowledged that using paper ballots was a bad thing because there was uh, um, graft and, and bad stuff happened when you counted paper ballots. So that was an issue, and that was one of the most precipitous causes because the election, that that decision to use paper ballots and that had discounted the progressive attitude occurred on June 2nd. So now we're up to within 10 days of Miners Union Day. And this is on here, the Ludlow Massacre in April 20th, two, two months earlier. It, it cannot have happened without affecting the attitudes here in Butte. The Ludlow Massacre was outside of Trinidad, uh, Colorado. It was a coal mine there. A strike was in progress. The miners were living in a tent city with families and children. They had basically been evicted from town or didn't have a place to live. The National Guard and the company thugs attacked that tent city outside of uh, Trinidad, Colorado, and they killed 2,024 people, including women and children, mm. as well as the miners. So that having just happened, it, it is inconceivable to me that that did not have an impact on the attitudes here in view. I can imagine the, the radical progressive leaders thinking, okay, now it is truly a fight to the death. They are going to kill us. Um, and the uh, uh, other side thinking, well, if it does come to that, I guess that's what we'll have to do. Now, that's not to say that most of the miners in Butte really were involved in all of this. It was probably, I would probably say many hundreds and then many thousands that were just curious onlookers, bystanders, and whatever. Um, and most of the miners just wanted to go to work and get paid. That's what they wanted to do. So, yes, there were radicals, and yes, there were complications. 
But the Lindholm massacre, I believe, had to have had a significant impact on attitudes here. So union versus union, the Western Federation of Miners and the Butte Miners Union, local number one, and the IWW, again, it is not that cut and dry. It is not that straightforward. And, and I think I'll present evidence for you that says that it wasn't even significantly this, the IWW. There isn't really any doubt, though, I don't think, that it was anti-WFM. That's what it was. It wasn't so much pro-IWW, it was anti-WFM and the way that they had been conducting uh, union business here in Butte. So, uh, having said that it's union versus union, where's the company in all of this, the Anaconda Company? How many, how many mining companies do you think there were in Butte in 1914? You know there was the Anaconda Company. You know there were the William Clark companies. How many companies do you think there were all together in Butte in 1914? 70. 70. 70 mining companies. This kind of freaked me out the other day when I discovered it too. I, I probably would have said, oh, 15 is what I would have said, something like that. And, and there are some on the list here that are Anaconda companies, the Butte in Boston in the Hennessy building, that's an ACM company, the Boston in Montana. And there are probably more than one on here that were Clark companies. Nonetheless, you put that filter, there's at least 50 different mining companies in view. So the companies were not a unified block either. Well, or were they? Kind of they were. The way you read about this in the secondary sources is that the companies stood aside in all of this 10 days that we're about to talk about um, and just waited to see what was going to happen. They, they cannot have been unhappy <laughs> about, the, about the tensions between the unions, because they certainly did not really like the unions at all. It was against what the company stood for, which was slavery, practically, at that time. So, uh, uh, but, but, I, but I, I have had to tell many people who flat out think that the union hall <coughs> destruction was company versus union. That's most definitely not the case. It was fundamentally an internal union thing. It's not to say that the company didn't have activists or interest, interest. they certainly had interest. But exactly what they did, who knows exactly what they did. That's, that's not recorded. Nor would it have been, given that they controlled the newspapers. So, Friday, June 12th. Actually, let's go back to Thursday, June 11th. At the Speculator Mine, which was owned by the North Butte Mining Company, not an Anaconda Company, the North Butte Company. At that mine on the 11th, the first miners refused to show their WFM, Western Federation of Miners, cards to the union men who were checking them. Basically, the union was insisting, you have to belong to our union or we won't let you work. Forget the company. So there was this extra layer of, of filtration on there. And the first miner who refused to was a miner named Michael McDonald. And you're going to hear more about him in, in a few days. But that happened without much impact on the night of the 11th. On the night of the 12th, the, at the Speculator and at the Black Rock Mine, which was way up, this practically the, the most northern mine in the district, um, the miners, many of the miners, as many as 1,200, refused to show their cards and were denied work. So do you want to call that a lockout or a walkout? I don't know which it is. But in fact, the mines were shut down because there was nobody there to work on. And on the night of uh, June 12th, after this uh, uh, refusal to work or denial of work, however you want to look at it, happened, the miners came down Main Street from the speculator mine up there, up the hill in Walkerville, basically, almost Walkerville anyway, came down Main Street, down here to Broadway Street, and went to the auditorium. The auditorium was in the library. This is the old library building at the corner of, uh, this is Broadway right here and Dakota right here. So today, this is the Western Mental Health Building. And, and actually, the, the bottom of that, uh, the, of the present day building, is still the foundation of this building. It had multiple fires, and the one in 1960 effectively destroyed almost all of it. But the foundation and the floor plan, or not the floor plan, but the footprint of the present building that stands there is this building. So it's kind of still there in a way. The auditorium was on the second floor. 
And that's, uh, it was a big meeting hall, that's what it amounts to. So they came down here yelling and chanting all the way, what's wrong with the WFM? They are rotten. Things like this is what they were screaming as they came down here. Had a mass meeting, and at the meeting on, on the, not on the night of February, uh, uh, of June the 12th, Friday, June the 12th, they did propose to create a new union. It had a name, I don't remember what it was, it was like the Butte Independent Miners Union or something like that. That was only a proposal. There were proposals to attack the Miners Union Hall that were rejected. There were other proposals for violence that were rejected on this night, the night before. So now we're going to come to the next morning, Saturday, Miners Union Day. No, that's the wrong one. There's the button. Oh, Miners Union Day. Okay? Here's the route of the parade. I just was talking to Jim here. Neither of us knew what the route was until, <coughs> until I found out like last week by finding it in the newspaper. They started at the Miners Union Hall right here, and for reference, we are right there now. That's where we are right now. So just over there is where they started, and they went north up Main Street, up to Woolman. They encircled the original mine, which is there, over on Woolman to Montana, down Montana to Granite, off Granite to Washington, so they're getting out into the neighborhoods even, down Washington to Park, Park all the way out to Covert, where they did a U-turn, and they turned back upon the parade, went up uh, Arizona, and then to Broadway, and it was to end at the Broadway Theater. I was not able to figure out if there was an intent of being a, a, a party or something like that at the Broadway Theater, um, but that's the route that was planned. Now, all of this didn't happen. Here's the newspaper for that morning on June 13th, Saturday, the day of Minor Union Day Parade. Today is the day, and this is the life, the cartoon says. Here's Pa getting ready for the parade. Here's the kid who's going to go play in the band. All this stuff. Everyone's planning to go out to the gardens. Two ways to celebrate with uh, plenty of this. You're the only girl I ever loved. And a little of that. Oh, he's got a black eye. They were expecting a little bit of fighting. I think that was a routine event during Miners Union Day. But with all of this, look what's right next to it. Several hundred would break away from the WFM fathered by the IWW. That is the reflection of the mass meeting that had happened the night before in the auditorium after they had come down from the speculator mine. So it's right here, it's all together. We're not, we're not talking about something that was flat out spontaneous. This was a buildup, a significant buildup of years, yes? Did the paper prints get then? The miner did, uh, often, I would say, usually. Uh, so it didn't have to be a crazy event, but yeah, their front page routinely had red headlines in this time frame. So, <clears throat> so here's what happened to the parade. We've gone from the Union Hall up Woolman and yada yada yada, and we're coming up Park Street right here. Right, the newspaper report, pretty much everything was cool until the uh, ACM band, the Anna County Copper Mining Company band, crossed Montana Street here at Park. So the intersection went up there by the Pita Pit now today. Um, and as they came over here into the block between Montana and Dakota Street, the, the jeering and cat calls began in earnest. There had been a little of that before. It is not perfectly clear to me exactly what part of the parade we were in. I infer that it was very close to the front of it. The leaders on horseback included uh, Bert Riley, who was the president of the Butte Miners Union, and you'd expect him to be uh, in the forefront <coughs> of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Some other mounted uh, union leaders that were marshals of the parade, not in the modern sense of a grand marshal, but marshals just to, uh, to be there and be pretty, I suppose, and then the ACM band. So as all of those entities crossed in through here, the cat calls and so on began loudly and in earnest. And there was some surging in the, in the crowd, in the, in the uh, audience and so on. As they cross Dakota Street and get into here, they start really attacking the horse horse-mounted uh, leaders of the parade, and Burt Riley and, and the other main officials, they galloped off, I infer, down Park Street. But there was a guy named Mike Conway. He was one of the marshals of the parade. And I don't know why. I really read the articles in great depth to try to see if I could figure out why they targeted him. I suspect it was opportunity. He was the one that they got, is what it probably comes down to. But Mike Conway was attacked right in here, right in here. The, there was a carpet store right here. This is the, um, 
public defender's office here, and the bus kiosk is right here. So right in that stretch of Park Street is where the main attack began. The crowd surged in. The band had to quit playing because they were so accosted by this crowd. And they attacked um, uh, Mike Conway. He turned around and rode up Dakota Street right here. And by the time he got up to the corner of Dakota and Broadway Street, he was dragged from his horse. He was kicked. And, and bloody quite significantly. They were calling to lynch him. They were calling to kill him. That was what the calls were in the crowd. Well, they didn't. God knows why. But they put him back on the horse, bloody. And, and he headed down Broadway Street. And when he got to Main Street over here, somewhere around, around the corner of Main and Broadway, Police Chief Jerry Murphy took him into some place, unspecified, but a place of refuge. So I wouldn't be too surprised if we didn't take him just a little further up here to the, to the jail, which is in the, uh, the city hall, just a half a block beyond that corner there. So Mike Conway had escaped. Well, the mob has all followed. The mob is now here in this stretch of Broadway Street between Dakota and Hamilton, mostly, and working their way down that way. Well, by the time they get here to the intersection of the uh, Main Street Alley, that's the alley, that's Club 13 right there. <laughs> this is um, the Piccadilly Museum right here. This is the <coughs> National Bank building. This is, what's this? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the Glacier, old Glacial Bank building, right. So in this alley, somewhere in that alley, an agitator, who knows who he was, Started, started demanding that the mob attack the Miners' Union Hall. It was the same guy from the night before. I don't know who it was. Nobody knows who it was. And what happens is the mob then does, in fact, go up to the Miners' Union Hall, which they ransack. So here's the scene on Broadway. This, the photographer must be standing pretty close to the intersection of Dakota Street and Broadway. We're looking uh, east on Broadway. Uh, the miner building there is, uh, was a five-story building, and if it was still there, we'd see the back of it from right here today. Those of you in the back can probably see the Lega Hotel over there, the big blocky building. This is just about right in front of the Lega Hotel, pretty close. Uh, and the Lega Hotel had just opened about three months earlier, so it was brand new <coughs> when this was all happening. <coughs> The Empress Theater is right here. This is the second Empress Theater. It was this one where Charlie Chaplin played his second appearance in Mute and has been gone since 1935. So this right now today, this is the parking structure next to the CCCS uh, buildings. It had become, if you're old enough, the, the Greyhound turnaround spot is what it was. So this is what that scene looked like. We go up to Main Street. This is the view from the Miners Union Hall. This is, this is the crowd that was out there. Uh, as, uh, as things began to really happen. Here's the view looking the other way. That's the Miners Union Hall right there. These three buildings are the three buildings that were exactly in the parking lot of the archives, the new parking lot right over there. This is the National Market. I forget the name of this boarding house. It was torn down in, under, under model, model cities in 1970, and I don't know what that one is. But those three buildings were in here, and then the alley, Right there, that's the alley right behind the archives. So here's the Union Hall. You see the size of the crowd. It was not trivial. It was thousands, at least 2,000. <coughs> they attacked the Union Hall, and there was nobody really in there, I guess. At least no resistance was put up, shall we say. Um, and as they attacked the Union Hall, uh, they broke all the windows. You can see the broken windows there. They essentially ransacked the place. Everything was torn out. Carpets were ripped out and thrown out the broken windows. All the furniture was thrown out. Everything on the inside was destroyed. So I think ransacked is the best word. The building was not destroyed. And Alderman Frank Curran, who was the acting mayor, there were three different acting mayors that day, he was trying to, to, to call the crowd from one of those windows, I don't know which one, but one of those windows trying to calm the crowd and be you know, logical and reasonable and whatever. And he was pitched out the window. Oh, he, the good news is he fell on some of the carpets that had already been thrown out. <laughs> Otherwise, he almost certainly would have died. Because if he'd landed on the concrete, he would have died. As it was, he dislocated his ankle and he broke his wrist and, and had many other kinds of cuts and bruises and whatever. He did survive, yes. Did the Union House both downstairs and upstairs and all the upstairs? Um, You'll see it in the next picture, but right here, that, what that says right there, it says Duffy's. That was a saloon. 
And I don't know for sure what was in this part of it over here. I suspect it was an office. But fundamentally, the Union Hall, the big room where they met, was on the second floor. So it's possible that they may use some of the lower floor, but fundamentally it was the upstairs. It's where they met. And that was a saloon right there. And here is the view. Now you can see the W's better of the front of it uh, uh, some days later. It still shows the debris and so on, everything that had been tossed out there. And once again, this is the block that's in uh, those three buildings were right here straight east of where we're sitting right now. There's the inside. That's, that's, that's the level of ransacking. All of the furniture, everything that was not nailed down was thrown out the window. Everything. So debris, smashed. All, all glass was smashed. Okay? And you know about the safe. The safe, the safe was, ironically, the safe was actually initially taken out by the police for safekeeping. Well, that lasted until they got it down to the street, I guess. I'm not perfectly clear on that. But it was definitely commandeered by the miners, uh, the, the, the rebels, whoever they were. And um, you'll read some things that say it was taken to a nearby field. It was not taken to a nearby field. It was taken to the Tivoli Brewery, which was way the hell down there. Here is Uptown. There's the courthouse. Here's Montana Street. This is Front Street right here, and this is Centennial. It's called Centennial, you know why. It went to the Centennial Brewery, which is that one, and it went on to the Tivoli Brewery, which is that one, both here along Silverboat Creek. So where they took it was to a field near the Tivoli Brewery. Took a couple of blasts. The first drunk who was trying to blow it up insisted that he had nitroglycerin, but it turned out it was vodka or gin. <laughs> it caught fire, but didn't blow anything up. They finally got the right stuff, and they blew it up, and, and here is the photo of it. As, as it looked after the, after the um, blowing up. They did find money, um, depending on who you want to read, anywhere from $800 to $1,600. The very first report said $1,350, so something like that. That's quite a bit of money in those days. But more important, they found papers, and the point of it was to try to prove that the Western Federation of Miners had been doing these deals, like say with the Michigan people not paying them as much as they told the locals here they were paying, things like that. So uh, um, none of that was exactly really ever proven conclusively, but I think the attitude at the time was that the papers were more important than the money. So, here was the headline on the Butte Miner. Uh, yeah, disorders. <laughs> disorders indeed. And um, this scene here is marching north on Main Street. This would be somewhere between right here and Woolman. They're probably, I didn't try to figure this out exactly, but I think that, that uh, we're probably just, have just left the Miner's Union Hall. It's probably one of these in here. And the original mine would be to the right of this. And then this is after they uh, were up there ransacking the Union Hall. That's it right there. Again, that you can always tell the, the front of the National Market was always white. And so that's the, that's the National Market right there. So, yes, exciting scenes. Cool, okay? Uh, well, this was a very big deal. But the building still stood. Um, and um, so what's going to happen? Well, the next day, pretty much nothing happened. It was a Sunday, and there was peace in, in town. So now we're up to Monday, June 15th. The miners went back to work at those two mines where everything had, had uh, precipitated the whole event. The civil city became normal. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was better than it was on Saturday, but it wasn't exactly normal. A lot is going on behind the scenes, if not, if not overtly. And um, on the governor had, oh, sorry, sorry, push on the wrong button here. The governor had been called to uh, uh, call out the troops, the militia. Well, he wasn't going to do that unless he could see for himself that there was a problem. So the time he got here, the city was normal. <laughs> Nothing was going on. Yeah, the building had had its windows broken out or whatever, but it wasn't that big of a deal. So everything seemed to be as he did not call out the troops. So that was Monday. Let's go ahead to Wednesday now, Wednesday the 17th. This is a pretty big day in the course of that week. 
what is happening is the uh, reluctant miners are, or, or the, the rebellious miners are calling for a vote to not technically to remove themselves from the Western Federation miner. The, the vote, and, and we're here, this is the front of the auditorium, the, the library over there. Uh, this is Broadway Street right here. Um, uh, the, the question was, will we continue to show our union cards, our WFM union cards, when we go to the mines? That was what the question was. The effect it was going to have would be, if you don't show them, you're effectively discarding the, and, and, and refusing the Western Federation of Miners. On the same day, the 17th, Charles Moyer, remember him? The president of the WFM since 1902 is on his way from Denver to Butte. He gets here on, on the early hours of the 17th. The vote was carried out from 10 in the morning until midnight so that all the shifts would have an opportunity to vote. And the vote was overwhelming. 6348 basically rejecting the Western Federation of, of uh, Miners. And what I said earlier, that the paper ballots were <coughs> questionable, shall we say, uh, it's all in here, but they had unbelievable amount of poll watching, shall we say. There were like five witnesses who watched every transaction. They watched you voting, not to see how you voted, but to watch the fact that you voted. Then they watched as you carried your ballot to here. Then they watched as the guy took the box with the ballots in it to wherever he took it. They watched while they counted everything. So they were taking great pains to make sure that this vote was a legitimate vote is what it amounts to. So, but that's kind of overwhelming. That was, in the eyes of the rebels, a mandate. Meanwhile, Charles Moyer is out there speechifying. <coughs> saying he, he, he got the most obnoxious, the most hated local union leaders to resign their officerships. The president and, and others resigned. And he said, and we will have new elections. But only WFM card-carrying members can vote. And, and as Jerry Calvert puts it in, in the Gibraltar, which is the best resource on this, it was too little too late. And it was still obnoxious. It was still in your face. We still really control, and we don't really care what you think, because we know what we can do. That was the attitude that was coming across loud and clear from Charles Moyer. So that was on the same day as the election was held, or the vote. Meanwhile, same day, they're talking to President Wilson, <laughs> and no, he's not going to. Partly it's because the uh, Montana representatives, uh, Senator Myers and Representative Evans here, uh, told the president that no necessity exists for the federal troops at the present time. And that was mostly because of the local government administration <coughs> statements. Mayor Duncan, who was really, truly, apparently trying to keep the peace and, and make some kind of a compromise happen, really, it sounds like, really believed that a compromise could be reached. He believed it. He said he believed it anyway. So, no federal troops. <clears throat> Sunday, June 21st. The rebels now, with that mandate of 6,000 plus to 200, have a meeting in the Holland Arena. Anyone know where the Holland Arena was? Down the end of uh, Montana Street. Right, it's where right. Wysig's Tires is now, just oh, immediately Schwab. south of the Safeway. Schwab, Schwab. Yeah, Schwab, sorry. Schwab. 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 It's a tire company. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I haven't figured out exactly what the orientation is of this photo, but I think that this is Montana Street right here, and the Holland Street is on the other side of it, and then the Safeway and Front Street would be just beyond that. So I think we're looking to the northeast is the view here. It was the only place big enough to actually get everybody in one room is what it amounted to. And in this one room, they met and they created a new union. They created the mine, the Butte Mine Workers Union, BMWU. Instead of, it's so confusing, instead of the Butte Mining Miners Union. But that was the Butte Mine Workers Union. And Mucky McDonald, the guy who had started it all in some ways back on the 11th of June, was elected the president. You can see here in these headlines with the creation of it, this here says no IWW. Well, it was no WFM and it was officially no IWW either. This actually pissed off some of the remote IWW leaders who said, you double-crossed us, you know. We wanted you to become an IWW affiliate. And they truly were trying, at least by lip service, to be an independent union. 
McDonald, Mucky McDonald, was flat out accused of being a socialist and an IWW member. He was neither. Um, basically, as all of this got complicated, the, the WFM was truly, truly pinning it on the IWW. No one that was arrested was an IWW member. Now, I'm not about to say, it would not be true, that there was no IWW agitation. There was. Absolutely there was. But was this hundreds of outsiders coming in sent by the IWW? There is no question that that's not true. It was not that. Yes, there were outsiders. But hundreds stirring everything up? No, this was fundamentally a local, grassroots, spontaneous response to the way the local Butte Miners Union of the WFU, of WFM was handling everything in Butte. That's how it seems to me anyway. Okay, up to Tuesday morning, June 23rd, so it's two days ago from now, 100 years. The WFM is still going to meet. A uh, lawyer is calling the meeting. He's expecting hundreds, if not thousands, of loyal supporters, the loyalists to the WFM to show up at the Miners Union Hall, just right over here, that evening. And uh, this guy, Kid Davis, he was involved in the blowing up of the, of the safe. I don't think he was ever arrested, actually. The only arrests that actually transpired in all of this, uh, we'll get to that in a minute, we're not that far along yet. So they're going to have their meeting. It's going to be right over here. It's going to be at 7.30 tonight. Actually, 7 o'clock, sorry, 7 o'clock tonight. And now, about 8 o'clock tonight is when the problems begin. According to the best information, which has to come from the newspapers, there's really nothing else to go by, uh, a late arrival, a card-carrying member of the WFM was coming to the WFM meeting on the second floor in the Union Hall. And somebody fails to identify him and decides he's an intruder and shoots him. There can be no question that the guys in the Union Hall, and, and instead of getting many hundreds, they got, depending on the report, a few dozen, which I take to mean 50 or 60, possibly 100. That's the most that they have. And there were 2,000 men in the street outside, just hanging out, waiting to see what was going to happen. So they had to be nervous in there. So anyway, they shoot the guy. His name was... Uh, I think his name was Paul Bruneau, something Bruneau, who, who, who he really was legitimate. He was shot, he fell down the, the uh, mm -hmm. stairs, and then that basically precipitated a gun battle. People started shooting here, there, and everywhere. There were shots fired out of the Union Hall into the street where Ernest Noy was killed. He's the only death in the whole, in the whole affair. Ernest Noy was truly the innocent bystander. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, others, a few others were injured more by flying debris than they were by, by guns. I think, I think three others were wounded. And um, the, the only death was, was Ernest Noy, who was standing out there. So uh, that's what precipitated the gun battle. Well, it also precipitated Moyer and everybody else that was in the Union Hall leaving. <laughs> that, was a, that was a good idea. That was kind of a no-brainer, I think. <laughs> so they leave out the back door. And Jim, was it you that was telling me about the neighbor? It was uh, Kim. But yeah. The, yeah, they, they worked their way through the, uh, the half the residence next door at, I think it was 10 West Copper. Which would be right off here in the alley. Yeah, and, uh, and got out that way. Yeah. And the woman in the house just kind of stood there not knowing what to do. Right, let us go. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so nobody was in the building in the next, not very long, a few minutes, maybe 20 minutes, when some of the mob goes up to the steward mine I don't know why they didn't go to the original. They went to the steward, though. They went to the steward, and at gunpoint, they got the hoist engineer to lower the cage with them on it. They intelligently did leave someone behind with the hoist engineer. <laughs> they go down to the 1,000-foot level, where, again, at gunpoint, they make the station master down there take them to where the dynamite was stored. They bring the dynamite back to the union hall, and they start blowing it up. It took 20 blasts all through the night. It goes on from about about uh, 9 o'clock at night until 2 o'clock in the morning before it's finally demolished. This is actually the previous Saturday's photo, but that's the headline of the standard. And here's the famous photo of what it looked like when it was all done. And uh, so the Union Hall has been destroyed, and the next day, as it was after the parade day, was kind of peaceful. Not much going on. 
there is all kinds of cool stories about Moyer floating through the crowd and all these different things going on. Um, but uh, uh, the, the place was destroyed now. It was already in process of repair from the previous week, but now there was no hope for repair. And what do we have that comes after this? Because this truly is hugely significant, not just in view, but in the labor movement nationally, which means the labor movement internationally. It leads to the uh, miners working, by the BMW, the new one, this is the new one. <laughs> the new one begins what was called militant unionism. What I mean by that is, they were impressing people into the union. You're not going to join, you are going to join. That's what it came down to. And the ones who truly would refuse to join were deported. They took them and put them on the train and shipped them out of town. Well, the cops brought them back the same day, but they were deported. This was, this was pretty militant. They also started announcing to their membership what they would do with respect to the company. The company didn't like that. The companies didn't like that. And so the companies, oh, sorry, the companies began to hire more private guards. This, as you can see, going to lead up to 1917 and Frank Little and, and things like that with the Pinkertons and the whole works. All that is going to be coming from this because of the tensions now that are not just within the union, but the union is starting to piss off the companies. And so now we have a broader battle, in fact. On August 30th, depends on what time of night it was, 29th through the 30th, an explosion rocked the parrot uh, rustling card office. The, the company called it the employment office. The miners called it the rustling card office, the place where you had to go get a rustling card. Um, and, and it didn't really do a whole lot of damage, but it was a big explosion. It was heard all over town. That next day, not Mayor Duncan, not the local cops, but local businessmen, I infer, including especially the Anaconda Company, called the governor, Governor Stewart, and said, we are having a, an insurrection here. We have a problem. They're blowing up everything. Well, it's the second thing that's been blown up, and it wasn't even blown up. But the governor is ready, and the governor now does mobilize the militia, the National Guard, and they come to town uh, in, within two days. Martial law existed in Butte from September 1st until early November. These are some of the famous photos that you've seen of the Gatling guns on the front steps of the courthouse. There was another Gatling gun nest that was set up right out here at Alaska and uh, Court Street, too. So, now it's a big deal. The saloons were closed, oh my god. <laughs> the, the theaters were closed. Well, that's all right. But the saloons were closed. Within days, the saloons were begging to be open at least during certain hours. No, not going to happen. So, martial law. Within a few days, though, the ACM declares, we will not recognize the Butte Mine Workers Union nor the Butte Mining Union. Neither one of them. Not the old one, not the new one. So that's what an open shop is. Before, it had been a closed shop. Everybody had to be a member of the Butte Mining Union to be, to be able to work. Now, anybody can come to work. They don't have to be a union member at all. And now, the, 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 the lines are drawn, essentially, now, between the company and the union, or unions, however you want to look at it. The union only lasts a little bit longer. Mayor Duncan is impeached, along with the sheriff. They, and they were both convicted, in fact of dereliction of duty and allowing for d destruction of property. They were removed from office in late September. And that was effectively, sorry again, <laughs> effectively the end of the socialist uh, movement politically in view. Because Mayor Duncan was truly a socialist, and he truly uh, embodied, I think, the, 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 the socialist attitude. And he was done. So there was still socialism and things going on in view for the next four years, probably five years, but by 1920 for sure, the socialist movement was dead, yes. Did remember Mayor uh, Hosworth was a full socialist and elected four times. Yes, yes, so it did come back. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then lastly, the Butte Mine Workers Union effectively died within, uh, I think it was just after uh, martial law, so in early September, under martial law, the things, the, the militant unionism <coughs> of those people that was happening, that wasn't going to work anymore under martial law. And so uh, they set out to find the officers. Mucky McDonald was in hiding. 
He was captured, I think it was on the 9th, maybe the 10th of September, hiding in uh, a house down at, um, it's, it's the vacant lot just north of where the Peking Noodle Parlor is, so uh, Galena and, and Main Street is where he had been hiding for some days. He was arrested, all the officers were arrested. What were they arrested for? Yeah. Kidnapping. Kidnapping, exactly <laughs> right. Kidnapping, but in, in terms of that deportation of the, the few miners that would not agree to become a member of the, of the new union. And Mucky McDonald actually spent uh, the next two years in jail. When he got out, he left Montana. So the officers were sentenced. The, the Butte Mine Workers Union essentially ceased to exist at about that time uh, uh, in uh, September, October, for sure by November. While it was all happening, life goes on. I, I, love, I love finding this picture. This is June 19th, right in the middle of that amazing week. And here are the kids enjoying itself out at uh, Columbia Gardens. And, and you don't have to go very far to read the things in the paper that, you know, our life did go on. There isn't any question about that. At least until uh, uh, the 28th. <laughs> That's just uh, four days, five days after the Union Hall was destroyed. You know what happened on June 28th, 1914? In, in Sarajevo. Yeah, Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated. And the front pages begin to change a little bit after that. And instead of just our stuff, it's also the Great War. Yes? When the ACM declares an open shop, what happened to the other companies? They also go open They did, in fact. Uh, they, the, in the newspaper, they have the signatories to the agreement. Uh -huh. ACM is the head of the list, but there's like at least 18 other companies. Um, and the newspaper says, and the only one that didn't sign it was this guy because he was out of town, but he will when he gets back. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, at least all the big ones did. I mean, some of those 70 must have been one man outfits. Yeah. Um, but all of the big multi, uh, all the ones that would have cared about unions did sign it. So, the Gibraltar by Jerry Calvert is, in my view, by far the best resource if you're interested in this kind of thing. It is a secondary resource, of course, but it is outstanding scholarship, and it has uh, an entire chapter about what we've just been talking about here. And then the rest of it, the subtitle is Socialism and Labor in Butte, Montana, 1895 to 1920. It's, it's a hell of a book, a really great book. And there are two other labor uh, sources coming up out fairly soon. If you don't know about the Butte America Foundation, this uh, is an organization that is spearheaded by Amanda Curtis, our former one of our former uh, representatives, mm -hmm. and they will be focusing on social justice, and that does include labor things, of course, and hopefully, I think it's sometime next year, they plan to have a radio station, a Butte community ra radio station that will be based probably in the Carpenters Union Hall, and then this uh, Butte Lake, sorry, the Butte Labor History Center here is a thing that, that I'm working on with some other folks here in town, and we hope, I don't know, it's a matter of buying a building that, that I don't even want to tell you all the hassles. Uh, so we can't do anything official until the building is actually closed on. But once it happens, we're going to have labor history out there for, it's going to become an attraction, that's <coughs> anyway. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.